the man frees the tiger. Now the tiger is free. Welcome back to tying that guy. I'm Wes Chatham. Host. A uh, part host. The other host over there is Ty Frank. Say hello, Ty. Hello, Ty. <laughs> um, what are we talking about today? Yeah, so this one is a little last minute. We were, we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And the thing that Wes and I do when you guys aren't watching, the, the other thing Wes and I do <laughs> when you guys aren't watching, is talk about the recent media we've been, we've been checking out and seeing if we want to maybe talk about it on the podcast or whatever. And the thing that Wes and I were both talking about every time we got together was the recent season of Fargo. Season five of Fargo, which I think they're five seasons in. I think it might be one of their best seasons. Season five has been amazing. And so we were like, what the fuck? Why not talk about season five of Fargo? Oh, and by the way, just in case you, if you haven't watched it, the last episode just came out a few days ago. If you haven't watched this season, we will probably spoil the shit out of it. So if you're interested in Fargo, especially if you're interested in season five of Fargo, you should go do that. You should go watch that. I really enjoyed the season of Fargo. And again, either. I still think season two might be my favorite, but this is a very close second. It's one of the best shows that I've seen in a long time. And I think season two of Fargo is probably one of my favorite seasons of television. It's up there in my top five favorite season television of all time. Season season two is definitely in my top five season twos ever because season two is tricky, right? Some shows have a great first season and you can tell that all the story the writers came up with is all used in the first season and they're just like they you don't know then some different stuff i mean like I, I know i'll probably get some hate for this but like i was fascinated by the first season of lost i watched the first episode of the second season of lost and i never watched another episode i was like they have no idea what they're doing they're making it up as they go and and it became very clear to me that all the good ideas that they'd had they kind of used them all up in the first season and now they were just sort of like throwing shit at the wall so season twos are tricky. I think uh, this show and just I think season two of Justified is one of my favorite seasons of that show. Season two of The Wire, one of my favorite seasons of that show. So all my favorite shows, it's like you watch the first season and you're in. Then you watch the second season. And if the second season is strong, you're like, all right, fuck it. I'm in for life now. And that's what happened with Fargo. After the second season of Fargo, I was like, well, I'm going to watch all of them now. So no matter what. And there's been some ups and downs, but I've stuck with it the whole way through. We, we've talked about Lost in the show before, and you talk about hate. There's only five or six people that listen to this show, so I'm pretty sure you can... Did, you we, can, did we just lose two people? We I'm don't pretty, even have our eight anymore. You can lose like it, two. but I'm pretty sure you can weather the hate storm of, like, <laughs> of the, of the, the four six or five people. The six people who are left yeah, are sending the hate mail. Are left. But we, we've talked about Lost you know, a lot on this show. And you know, one of the things that I think is interesting that they've done with the series, and I, and I read an interview with Noah Hawley, and he says that, you know, initially the pitch was, or they were thinking about like, what if Fargo was a series? Because it could be a series, the movie, you turn that into a series where it's like a new crime or whatever right. every week. And he said, you know, he felt instinctively that that goes against the spirit of, of Fargo because he sees her next day being a normal day. That yeah, this I case, agree. I agree with his yeah, take on that. That yeah. this case was the weirdest case that just happened in her life and her next day is going to be a normal day so yep. then he was then in saying he believed that the spirit of the show is these crazy incidents that happen in the midwest these yeah. weird things and that is the thing that happens so dot's day after the after a munch uh leaves her alone if he does or he doesn't but like her next day like there will be a, a sense of normalcy going forward but i loved the supernatural element in season five. One of my favorite things about this season was the sin eater much. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, you know what I think too, like right away when I was like, Oh, I'm on board for this season is the thing that you and I have spoken about a lot. The most underestimated character turns out to be a tiger, you know, like turns out to have yeah. this like survival resourcefulness um, in there. And I think the highlight you know, there was so many phenomenal scenes in this season, but the highlight for me is when she's sitting on the couch and you're still kind of oriented, like it's after the school function and the, and the riot and everything. And so you're like, oh, she's got a little spunk, a little feisty. And now you're kind of into her and you're interested. But when Munch rolls up with a kilt and a, and a bag over his head 
that whole sequence or whatever and how she yeah. survives and what she does was was the highlight of the the season for me. Well, let's let's I mean so if we if we're going to get into it, let's let's do a quick recap of what the season is. So the season is it begins with an attempted kidnapping of this woman who's married and has a kid and living in the Midwest. That kidnapping, that kidnapping fails. She gets away. And that failed kidnapping reveals a bunch of her backstory, why she is as tough and resourceful as she is. It sets a whole bunch of other events in motion, including stuff going on with her husband's family, who's this rich local family, stuff going on with the kidnappers, stuff going on with the guy who hired the kidnappers to kidnap her. And all of those threads get pulled into this larger narrative, this tapestry of story, at all starting with this kidnapping. So, so Fargo, the movie starts with a kidnapping, attempted kidnapping, right? Where the, the guys break in and they grab Jerry Lundegaard's wife and, and kidnap her. And, and that, that sets that story in motion. My take on this season of Fargo is like, Noah Hawley going, hey, what if it was the first movie, except it turned out that the mousy little Midwest housewife was actually a badass and she fucks the kidnappers up like that's to me. That is the 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 moment, the conversation that sets the whole rest of the season in in motion. It's just what if that mousy little lady who got grabbed by those two guys and carried off instead of getting grabbed, fucks them up because she's secretly a badass. And that's the whole the whole season is figuring out why is she a badass? What happened? What what in her life turned her into that? It's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating journey to go on. And when the the guy with the background, I mean, like if you were going to design the most terrifying random thing to happen, it's that munch rolling up with that. And what it, it, where did that hood come from? And he didn't wear it for the rest of the thing. And they come in and, and they break in. And her resourcefulness is a constant surprise for a long time until the whole sequence where they're in the gas station and. The whole, you know, all of that was fantastic. But then you realize like, oh, there's an internal strength to her. There's a spirit to her. Yeah. And I love the scene when Munch is, goes back with uh, John's, John Hamm's character. And he's like, you didn't tell me she was a tiger. <laughs> you know, like, Did, what are you doing yeah, sending me? Yeah. After? And he's like, she's just yeah, a little what, woman. He, and that's, and he, what, he, what the great thing about that moment, and we can talk more about that character later, because uh, he's a fascinating character. But the great thing about that moment is the, his recognition of what she is. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's like, he's like, Oh, this way you, you said, go kidnap a housewife. Yes. She is also a housewife, but in addition to that, she's a fucking tiger. Right. And you didn't tell us that part. Yeah. And, and why are you sending us to kidnap a tiger? What's going on here? Right. She's not particular. She's small. I mean, it's, it's Juno temple. I love Juno temple. I've had a huge crush on Juno temple since the movie horns with uh, Daniel Radcliffe. And she's based on a Joe Hill story. Yeah, based on Joe Hill's I've I've loved her since then. I think she's great. Uh, I like her in Ted Lasso. I think she's great in that too. I, so I've always really liked her. So when she showed up in this, I was like, oh, great. I love Juno Temple. She's great. But she's tiny. She's a tiny little person. You know, and you talk about like fight consistency. The thing the show never does is show her be like a badass or a karate master or any of that kind of stuff. The thing that that character has in the show is an absolute commitment to survival and zero time spent waiting for somebody to save her. Mm -hmm. She is never waiting for someone to come save her. She yeah. never, she's never screaming and hoping somebody comes and saves her. She is always like some shit's going down. I have to survive this. I'm going to do literally anything to survive and get out of this. And she has, she has no, she has no like uh, qualms. She has no, like, I'll only go this far. No further. No, she's going Whatever the furthest you have to go to get out of it, that's where she's going. And, and that's what makes her a tough. She never feels sorry for herself in any of the situations. Oh. And also, though, there is a confidence in her. So there, we've seen stories like this where they have this resourcefulness that's kind of a surprise to them. They didn't know that was in them. Right. This is different. There's a surprise in her, and there's marked moments. Even go all the way to the end, what I think is what I thought was like one of the most interesting things that she said is she's sitting down with that terrifying sin eater. And he's, you know, she's basically explaining the forgiveness and all that. And then she goes, but right. if you want to come back at another time and we got to finish this, you know, then we can do right. that. And I'm like, basically what? going, you know? yeah, don't, don't do this while my family is here. But if, if we need to go, we'll go. We'll go. And then when she's sitting and when she's talking to Jennifer Jason Lee, and, and I know this isn't like the last of us, we're going to go, we, we don't have enough time to go through each episode. So we're kind of doing like the main 
are expressed. But when she's sitting next to Jennifer Jason Lee and Jennifer Jason Lee is basically trying to threaten her and she says, yeah. look, bitch, if you want to go toe to toe with me, you better sleep with your eyes open because if anybody tries to take what's mine, they will die. You know, or something like that. Yeah. And, 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 and you watch the season and you're like, no, that wasn't an idle threat. No, no. Yeah. You see that. <laughs> so what I love about it is she has this confidence in her. Like there's nothing in her presence. She's, you know, lovely wife and mother and all this, but she has this presence here and she knows it's there. So it's like, you know, well, she, but she, she, she's already come through as we learn her back. Six layers of hell. She's come through hell. She's yeah. been there. She yeah. knows what it looks like. So nothing you threaten her with is going to scare her. Yeah. Right. She's, she's like, whatever, whatever. I I've been there. I understand. Yeah. Right. Um, it's sort of like that, you know, the, the the guys who, who go through the worst combat, they come back and there's just this sort of calm version of like, I've seen the worst humanity has to offer. You have nothing to show me. Right. You know? And then um, how, how detailed are we going to get in this? I, I'd love to talk about the overall plot and, and, and the characters. I mean, the, the overall plot, which is basically this kidnapping gone wrong, which exposes a number of things. One of those things is the, the backstory of the Juno temple character that she used to be married to a very controlling man and not just the normal controlling, not the usual abusive controlling man we've seen many times before, but like the leader of a militia kind of controlling where he's got like stockpiles of AK 47s in his basement kind of thing who had a very sort of like that, that Uber right wing version of what men and women are supposed to be that the woman is, basically the property of the man he he and is basically noah holly's reaction to yellowstone and january 6 and you know he has some specific thoughts about that you can see it yeah some show. specific thoughts uh but but he's that guy he's he's the, he's he's the kind of guy who goes over go, you know like those guys here in oregon who who took over the 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 nature park and like barricaded it with guns and demanded you know the the government get out of Oregon or whatever the fuck they were demanding. Um, it's those guys, the guys who are like, I don't like the way the country is going. So I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to make political change by shooting people. He's that guy. And to get out of, from under his thumb, to get away from him, she had to go to extreme. And in the course of that developed this commitment to survival, this commitment to freedom. She, she's not going to let anybody control her. That's a huge thing. And, and one of the interesting things about, her relationship with her husband is we get why she loves him because he, he makes no attempt to control her. And he's truly They're, kind, a truly, he's truly kind. kind. He truly cares about her and neither of them is controlling the other one. Right. I get why he's, why she's with him yeah. because that's what she was looking for. He, he's right? the anti Roy. He's the anti Roy, which some people would see and think that makes him weak. It's not weakness. It is, it is a, it's a diff, it's, you know, kindness doesn't mean weak. And he's just a kind man. He's a gentle man, right? And fortunately, he's married to a tiger. So somebody starts some shit. A tiger. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, they're like, what are you going to do? You going you gonna to fight me? And like, no, but my wife will. She'll yeah, fucking murder yeah, she'll you. Fucking live, I'll sick her on you. <laughs> One of the themes that runs through this is debts and debts owed and the, the power that, a debtor has over the the person that owes them. Jennifer Jason Lee is kind of like the queen of debt. She has yes. some kind of company that uh, is, is it a it might be a credit card company, but she basically became a billionaire off debt. And what did you think about her performance? It like did it did it change at all when you first saw her and you saw how she was the choices that she was making because she made some bold choices. And then at the end, when it all came together, what did you think about that? I thought she was a great character. I mean, she's very unlikable at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Deliberately so. The writing and performance both are very deliberate mm -hmm. all through this show. And, and she is written to be unlikable, and she plays it unlikable. And I, I've always liked Jennifer Jason Lee. I think she's a great actor and, and has only gotten more interesting the older she gets. I, I loved her in Hateful Eight, and I thought she made such great choices like with this, yes. because... I'm seeing what she's doing uh, when you first start watching it. It is barely hanging in there, but Fargo is a container that can, that can hold that performance. Yeah. But with that performance, over time, as it settles in, and then as she kind of has this arc, kind of, but kind of not really. She has an arc in her personal taste of her daughter-in-law, 
but she's still the same person at the end, at the beginning. No, I, I don't think she, I don't think she changes at all. Yeah. I think the thing that is revealed about, but how she feels did, about her daughter-in-law changes. It does. But the things that's revealed about her character, Jennifer Jason Lee's character is that she, she has two boxes. She has people she respects and then there's everybody else. And if you're not in the people she respects box, she didn't give a fuck about you. Right. She's, She's, she has nothing but contempt for everybody else. For At the beginning of the show, the Juno Temple character is in the everybody else box, right? She's not in the I, somebody I respect box. But as the show goes on and as more and more stuff about what she's doing and what her past is comes out, she gradually moves into the people I respect box. And once you're in that box, the Jennifer Jason Lee character is a, is a titan. She will fuck up anybody who comes for you, right? Yeah. She's very dangerous. And when she starts to respect Juno Temple, that ferocity now is on, is on her side, too. And the first time I, I realized that was the character path is when she hires the cop. When she's sitting and she's talking to the cop, and the cop is basically telling her to go fuck herself. And you just see this moment. Where she goes, oh, oh, you're interesting. I kind of respect you now. And you should come work for me because I respect you. And... That was the moment I'm like, oh, okay, that, that's how you get in with her. Yeah. The way to get in with her is just be somebody she can respect. I do think if she had any ounce of warmness that exists in her, I think it would go to the lawyer. I think she yeah. did have a special relationship to the lawyer, which really motivated what happens at the end. What also, yeah. you know. Yeah. The- yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, old Roy. He crossed a couple of lines he shouldn't have crossed. Yeah, I can't wait to get to that because that is, it was so satisfying and such a beautiful thing because if, well, we, let's talk a little bit about Roy and that whole, yeah. the, the family and everything that's set up. Yeah, so, so what we discover is that Juno Temple was the man she was married to, this very controlling, right-wing militia kind of guy. The thing I did, I did respect though is they didn't make him a white supremacist because he's got guys in his crew who are black. So he's not, of the white supremacist variety, well, he, but he's he, definitely he, of the. He becomes a white supremacist in prison, of yeah. course, because you know that's that's prison yeah. rules, baby. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But um, he's definitely on the ultra nationalist, ultra right wing side yeah. of the spectrum, and he's the sheriff of this county, where so he has, and he's a sheriff of a county that gives enormous power to its sheriff. He's like the king of that county. Yeah, he's the king of the county. Yeah, he's like, yes. yeah. yeah. So that's who Juno Temple's character is married to, is this guy. That's who she got away from. And he's running the county like his own personal fiefdom. He's stockpiling weapons and armor and ammunition for his militia there, um, gathering these like-minded uh, militia-type folks with him, building a little compound out in the, in the middle of the frigid tundra out there where he's got like a hidden spot where he can throw dead bodies. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy stuff out there. It's the best that's part of ha- having a lot of land. You, you, can, you, you can have like somebody? designated designated place to get rid of bodies and things like that. Um, I've got five acres of woodland. I could probably dig a <laughs> hole somewhere and keep it fairly hidden. Probably like you haven't already put a few in there. <laughs> and then he has a son named Gator. And, uh, and Gator is played by Joe Keery, who plays Gator. And, uh, you know, I think he did a really solid job with this. And I mean, ahead. you hate him. He's mm-hmm. contemptible. Yeah. You hate him even more than you hate Roy. Yeah. But th- he's doing a great, fine at, job as an actor because he definitely delivers a hateful performance. You know what? You ha- I, and I, I didn't hate him more than I hated Roy. Really? What he ended up being is what, one of the things that I think the performance is so great is I, you can see that in him. You see a scared boy that is yeah. desperate for the respect of his father, for the love of yeah, his father. Yeah, for sure. And his mother abandoned him, so he thinks, or so he was told when he was younger, you know, this guy desperately needs love and affection, and the only person in the house is the father, and the father happens to be Satan. And so right. he's, he's striving to please the wrong person, and I think Juno can see through that. I think she can see a decent person inside of him, and like a scared boy. And, and scared boys in the inside of a man are the worst people yeah the, the worst yeah. behavior comes out of those people and so you know the things that he did you know clearly like roy was doing things for a different reason than gator you could you could trace everything like he's just trying to get his father's respect he's just trying yeah. to get his father to say 
good job or, you know, I respect you or you're dangerous or whatever. I mean, he's driven almost entirely, as you say, by insecurity. And so he is, that shows up in two ways. One, doing anything he thinks will get his father to pay attention to him and respect him. And two, punishing anything he views as disrespect from other people because he's so insecure that anything that seems even slightly disrespectful, he has to go over the top. I mean, when, when you're secure in who you are, if you're, if you're secure and somebody you don't care about goes, go fuck yourself, you go, okay, well, yeah, have a nice day. Because yeah. you don't care. Who yeah. cares what that guy says, right? Yeah. But when you're that insecure, any perceived disrespect is blown incredibly out of proportion because they, they already feel like shit. Now you say anything that just making them dragging all that back up again. Yeah. So he, he shows up in both of those ways. And some of the stuff he does in this show to fight perceived disrespect is some of the worst stuff he does. Yeah. I think what's interesting about that whole family is uh, I've been doing some research for a project. I've been reading about certain uh, sheriffs in the South yep. and like the, in the sixties and seventies. And you read these things and you read their story and you're like, what well, is he? The, is he the general of, the, is he the king of, of the Georgia? Army? Like the <laughs> shit that shit, like the power that they had over yeah. their counties is unbelievable. It breaks. Yeah. It, it just, just it breaks my mind. And if you get a fucked up sheriff, then you, you need to move out of that county because, it, like, if I if it was in the sixties and you get a fucked up sheriff, you need to just get out of the county because they have way too much power. So this is kind of a throwback to those times. And so Gator is like the dark prince, or he thinks he's the dark prince, yeah. and he feels like the he there's no consequences for his actions. The rules don't apply to them. Yeah, that's right. He he does feel like he. Nothing bad is ever going to happen to him because his dad is too powerful and his dad will stop. Him. And how much did you enjoy uh, when they end up getting Juno Temple? They put her in the back of the car and they're driving and the cop pulls him over. And that whole sequence that takes us to the gas station. How great yeah. was that? How great was that? Yes. So, and, and this is where we get multiple threads sort of coming together. We get the dot trying to be kidnapped thread. We get Gator. And we get one of the big appearances of your favorite guy. What's his name? Munch? Munch. I think Munch. it's Munch. I think at the yeah. end, he, his name is different than what they called yeah. him, but I think it was Munch. And, and we get those overlapping. And then Munch shows up and sends a message to Gator and his dad about his displeasure with the contract uh, that he had previously been under. By pinning that message to the partner's chest with a fucking knife. Yeah. <laughs> well, but th- this yeah. is this is after they tried to assassinate him. Yes, yes. We, we you know we talk a little bit about that. Is that they he 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 fails the job, but during that sequence when the state trooper goes to pull her over, she meets the state trooper Whitfar, and you know it's that and 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 that's and and it's important to note that the only cops that are actually helpful to her are the ones that do not belong to the county. Mm -hmm. so he's a state trooper so he's not under the sheriff Mm -hmm. he's able to operate independent of the sheriff but that's why he's able to help her is because he's not and munch comes out of blazing dude he blows away that other cop they take off she and what was interesting is the cops they park and then she gets out barefooted and just sprints right past them and they're like what the fuck and they look up and then munch is just mowing people down and so then they end up both being uh hostages in this gas station and how she, it was, all, it was almost MacGyver-like, how she was figuring things out, how she was yeah. getting the ice for him to slip on and, uh, and patching him up. But she showed the state trooper kindness by helping him. And she was really good at that. Like, there's this strength, and she could drop into this fierce character when she would, but there's a, there was a genuine goodness to her, right, that, that radiated yep amongst these people that the people then you know rooted right, and, for and helped her and the trooper got hurt trying to help her. Mm-hmm. like you you definitely got a sense that that she is very clear on who's on her side and who's not on her side and if you're on her side she's going to do almost anything to help you if you're not on her side she'll do almost anything to fuck you up and it's that same commitment to going further than normal people would go in both directions so she goes way out of her way and takes risks to help the cop the straight trooper who's been shot and goes way out of her way to fuck up anybody who's trying to come in that gas station after her. And both things are true. Both things can exist in the same character. And she, she fucks that dude up. The other, the partner, when she breaks the toilet over his head, she yep. breaks, 
<laughs> he's like, he's done. He ain't going anywhere. <laughs> and then he sees that. I wonder how long that they were, how long Munch and that guy were partners for. Like, did Munch were they friends? Like, did did they just meet each other for this job? Yeah, but there's there's so much about Munch that is not explained. That is, it, I mean, we get some interesting tidbits about his past and who he is, uh, but why he's doing this kind of work, why he was partnered up with that other dude. Um, well, they, he, explain, that is ever he really kind explained. of explains it at the end. I mean, there's a lot that was explained about him. Now, when you were watching it for the first time and they shot back to the 1500s and he eats that guy's sin out of his body, were you on board immediately or were you like, where is this going or what is this? I, I was a little surprised. I was a little, it was unexpected. Yeah. I was a little surprised by it. Uh-huh. As I said, after, after season two of the show was so good, I was like, all right, I'm, as long as Noah Hawley remains involved in this show, I'm going to trust him. Because mm-hmm. uh, I, I have seen shows where they have really good second seasons and then the showrunner leaves and somebody else takes over and the show goes in the toilet in the third season. Mm-hmm. But that's not the case here. Noah Hawley has been involved every season and and strongly involved every season and at a certain point you gotta you gotta just kind of trust the storyteller yeah like he's got a reason for this he's there's a reason why he's doing this and i'm i'm gonna stick around and see what that reason is and so there are things that noah holly does that i feel like if it was in other hands that it would annoy me but when he does it i'm just along for the ride and i love having a supernatural strain through a really grounded real story. And so you have this sin eater and also, you know, thematically what it's saying. It it matches thematically and the thing like that, but it matches thematically, but it also works in, in practicality in the story where you, I enjoy his character. I love the mystery of him, the spookiness, the horror element of him existing his relationship with that old lady was wonderful. He just yeah. showed up and he's like, I live here now. And then they and she's slowly, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, and that, I love that lady. Like, she just kind of like, eh. and then they slowly build a relationship. Like over yeah. time, there's this kind of sweet relationship. Like he'll just be in the that, house, like randomly. <laughs> like when she's yeah. like, Why and you? it culminates with somebody fucks with that old lady. And that guy, does not have a good day. Nothing that happens to that guy after that is good. Yeah. And it, that happens to be her son, who is, I, to me, the most... It's, it's between her son and the golfer. I, I think I hate them more than Roy. I think that mm. I hate them. Like, they're the most... Her, the way that his son, her son was treating him, her, in that yeah. scene. And then it was so satisfying when Munch takes the ax is kind of a callback to the original Fargo. Yes. And in the it fucking is middle of the day in a fucking neighborhood just axes him down. And Roy's son, Gator messes with the old lady too. He and kills pays her. A, he pays a heavy price yeah. for having messed with the old lady. And, uh, and then he and pays he, a heavy price for that. Gator Gator killed her and then you see, you know, it's it's a great scene when Gator gets in the car and you see he him come up in the back. You see that uh, Munch come up in the back, and you're like, oh, shit. There's a lot of horror yep. elements to it. He says, why did you kill an old defenseless lady? She wasn't bothering anybody. And yep. so the, you see that he cared about her. That's the closest to a relationship he's had in centuries. And he, right. fu- and he fucking did that. And he took old Gator's eyes. He is terrifying. He's a terrifying figure. I mean, like... There's a reason why clowns are scary, right? Because they should be comical, but there's something when when done in a horror movie, there's something sort of dark underneath that comedic outer layer. And you look at him, and if you just sort of look at him without any other context, here's a guy wearing, you know, black punk rock boots, a black kilt, a puffy coat, and has that that goofy haircut. There's it's that's comical. He looks comical. But because he looks a little oh, comical. Three Stooges haircut. Doesn't somebody say? Yeah, the Three Stooges haircut. Three Stooges, but yeah. because he looks a little comical, when you realize what he is, that all that comedy turns into terror. All that comedy becomes, he's, not, he's no longer funny. He's horrifying. He's terrifying, right? And so if you walked into your house and that dude was standing there and goes, I live here now, your, your reaction would be like, I guess so, because I'm not about to start no shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, Don't start anybody, no shit. Anybody walks no down shit. the street in that outfit is not scared of anything. No, no. 
And he, there was something, there's something supernatural. Like he can walk amongst the world and not be noticed. And he was always one step ahead. They couldn't get anything over him to the point where Roy recognized, I don't want to fuck with this guy anymore. He's killed like half my men. So then he gives him the money and he's like, hey, take the money. I paid your debt back. And then fucking Gator, who, Gator. you know, had that uh, chip on his shoulder, made a big mistake. He, Roy saw what Gator can't because Gator was blind by his, lack of self-esteem is insecurity yep. um in in that moment and then you know well, he's metaphorically blind at that point and then later literally literally blind, blind. <laughs> um yep. the uh what did you think about the whole booby trap in the house when they all wore masks and they came in during halloween that whole sequence when they were coming to take her? oh where she burns her house down yeah I like I w- w- the thing i liked about it is that she was trying to do something and it didn't really work that 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 made it made her seem not supernaturally good at everything right yeah you know i mean it worked so it worked a little i mean you know it worked a little bit and and she keeps trying things and failing at them Mm -hmm. which is good because at some point if somebody's just always kicking ass and everything they try works and all that stuff then they're not a fun character anymore Mm -hmm. you need to see the tough guy get beat up sometimes you need to see the badass lose it sometimes you you know that kind of stuff and she kept trying things and, and, and there were holes in her education. There were things she didn't know. And she would try stuff and realize, Oh, I didn't understand how this works. When she tries to buy the gun and yeah. discovers that it doesn't work the way that she thought it did. And so she's not going to be able to get a gun. And, you know, I mean, those sorts of moments are, I think, important moments and having the traps not work the way she hoped they would work and cause other problems. I think that was important that we see that. And that plays out too, you know, when, when she's locked up in that little shed and yeah. he comes in there, th- those scenes were rough. Like the, the yeah. abuse scenes. And I mean, and it was those, those things that were kind of, it, it, you know, you're in the show and you're like, oh fuck, you know, but I well, know, I well, know it John has Ham to- is John Ham is gigantic. Uh-huh. He's super tall. He's a very big guy and he put on some weight for this role. So he's got a bit of a gut on him. He's a big, big man. And Juno Temple is tiny. I think she's like five feet tall. So she looks so small next to him. And when he's smacking her around, it's like watching a grown man beat up a child. It's so, it's so unfair. Like you have to, you have to have no conscience at all to do what he does. Right. Right. You have to be completely devoid of conscience. They, but they don't really show you the abuse. They well, show they don't, you. They, ne- they never, they never show him commit any sexual violence. Right. He does, he does, he does hit her. But then, but they do show you when she, when they're engaged and she's fighting back, like yeah. that's, they, that's when the story kind of like you, you, a lot of the stuff is a little bit turned away or a little bit not shown, but when she's yeah. engaged and she's fighting back, they tune in and you're watching and, and it's well, and so she loses. satisfying and she loses, well, no, but she, she hurts loses. him. She hurts him, but she, she loses, which again, you know, like if she had, if she had suddenly turned into Bruce Lee and, and kicked his ass, it. It wouldn't have felt real. It would have. It would have sort of broken the suspension of disbelief. She tries. I mean, she she does some clever things to to hurt him, and she does succeed in hurting him. But he's a gigantic guy, and she's a tiny little person. And ultimately, physics is just going to win out in that kind of case, and it does eventually. Physics just wins out. But she never gives up. She like you said, she never gives up. She never feels sorry for herself. And the minute she's the minute he's gone, she's making her next plan. Mm-hmm. She's. She, she, she's not giving up. She's like, okay, well that didn't work. So now I've got to do something else. And you see her immediately going to the next thing to try to get out of there. Her commitment to being free and surviving mm-hmm. is unflagging. Yeah. And her resilience. Yep. Toughness. I, I've been wanting to ask you and I didn't, we didn't get to talk after though, but what did you think of the, the puppet show episode where it gave her background and her story and all of those things? That, I think that's my least favorite episode. Because it's the classic, this was all a dream thing, mm-hmm. and I've never liked that. I thought that showing her backstory in a puppet show was clever in that we don't need to see her getting shit kicked out of her in real life, which I think is very, it would be very uncomfortable to watch that. I, don't, I do not want to see Juno Temple get her ass kicked. So I thought that was a clever way to tell that story without right. the sort of prurient violence version of it. But I always hate the, it was all a dream seat. Mm-hmm. So that, that made me enjoy it less. 
Well, what's interesting to me is Fargo gets away with things in with me personally, gets away with things that yeah. other shows that would kind of put me off. And so I watch this puppet show and on top of the, you know, kind of waking up and it was all a dream. She walks out in the parking lot and a car comes out of nowhere and just crushes her and knocks her down. <laughs> That's not connected to anything within the story. Yep. And then she goes to the hospital and when she goes to the, the she goes to the hospital, which is a, that was a terrifying scene when Roy showed, when she's like, is my husband here? Yep. And Roy shows up as the husband. But yep. as he's walking her out, Wayfair just happens to be in that County right. dropping off a, a, I don't know, maybe somebody that needed a lot. There's a lot of happenstance. Yeah. There's a lot of happenstance, it, but it's yeah. almost like a, a choice, like a, it was a choice, like a focused choice to do that. And if I feel like if I saw that in another show, I'd be like, wait a minute, where the, well, where the fuck did the car come from? And what was that yeah, yeah. connected to? And like, right. That was never explained, you know? And then, wait a minute, how does the lawyer run into, run into Wayfair at the gas station after the fact? Right. And then he's like, hey, you know, I'm just leaving Roy's barn, and that's where she is. And then the lawyer takes it upon himself to go then set her free. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of happenstance, but it seems like purposeful. It does it? Do you know? Understand what I'm saying? It does. It does. Yeah. It it doesn't feel like a bad writer making dumb choices. It it does feel purposeful, but it is it is a little it is a little weird. Yeah. That, that amount of happenstance is an an interesting take. Is or you know when I'm seeing the dream and you hear you see the story of Juno how she was rescued by that lady brought home and almost. Um, groomed to kind of be her replacement so then she can get away. Yeah. There is another instance in the show that reminded me of that moment. So Roy's wife now, when uh, he, after the debate, when he's humiliated, when there's like four Roy's up there and they're repeating what he's saying and everything, he's humiliated and he's coming home. The wife is provoking him in a way which to me makes him like, like provoking him to go harm dot because number one yes. she's jealous of a dot but number two yep. so it's not her and her daughters yes there I, I definitely got that same sense yeah that she was deliberately targeting she was aiming roy at dot for, and for i think for the exactly the same reasons you're saying she was she there's this weird jealousy of dot as the previous wife as you said she's aiming the harm away from her and her daughter go, be, go beat up on her because i don't like her anyway and i don't want to be the one who gets my ass kicked yeah. So I think in terms of most unlikable characters, it, it, you know, we should, that's what we should have done in the top five on this is like, who do we hate most in this show? And I think the old lady's son is, is definitely, I hated that guy. And I think the- He only gets like two minutes of screen time. And, and he's that's repulsive. how much I hated him. He's repulsive. Yeah. He's like just, it only took him two <laughs> minutes to be the worst he's character. He's repulsive. <laughs> and I hated uh, the golfer. I just hated the, the, that the guy. The cop's husband? Yeah, the cop's oh, he husband. he was the worst. <laughs> He's the he was the worst. Worst. But I will yeah. say, the one that might take the cake is Roy's father-in-law. <laughs> Roy's father-in-law. In the, in the, uh, really? Yeah, the Nazi? The one that was like, are you Hitler in the bunker? Are you Hitler in the at whatever? But I kind of liked that he challenged Roy to a fist fight at the end. <laughs> That was kind of cool. I, I kind of liked him then. Yeah. I was like, yeah, kick his ass, dude. Like, I wanted the old dude to whoop Roy's ass. Yeah, I just think, like, he was constantly in his ear and he was annoying and the shit that he was saying. Yeah. But I guess he kind of redeemed himself out of the top five I mean, by picking the fight He was kind of end. a Nazi. And, yeah. and it's, it is a good thing to hate Nazis. Yeah. I'm not pro Nazi. I'm yeah. anti Nazi. Yeah. So, for that reason, yes, he's, he's contemptible. Well, but at the end, when he's like, Roy, Let's go. Let's get it. Let's get it on. Yeah, like, when, Whoa, when, all right. All right, old start, man. You know, you take our dingers out or whatever. And they, they started. To, yeah, that is true. Because I did think like, I was like, are they fucking throwing down right now? I love yeah. this. That guy, you know, he's, he's about about it. And so uh, that was interesting. No, I think, I think the, the, uh, the old lady's son still wins. Well, okay. So the old lady's son is, is pretty repulsive. Uh, but he only gets a couple of minutes. The, I, for me, it would be, it would be the cop's husband. The yeah. golfer, because. He, he gets a bunch more, he, it's much more screen time and what he's doing. So, I mean, this entire season, all of season five is sort of about toxic relationships and good relationships, right? Like the difference between them and the different ways you can be toxic. So we see, we see the Roy version, which is you just a piece of shit who beats up your wife. That's one version of it. But there's another version like 
the golfer was never going to lay a hand on his wife. I'm pretty sure if he had, she'd have kicked the shit out of him. So he's not going to beat her, but he's the other version of that sort of toxic, abusive relationship because he's constantly demeaning her in sort of that nagging sort of way. He's living off of her, not contributing anything, uh, making their marriage about him him and his needs never about her and her needs he was the personification of selfishness that's exactly right yeah and and being so self-absorbed that not only is he toxic and and a horrible person to be partner with but he doesn't even see it he doesn't even know it like he think every time anything happens he thinks he's the victim he thinks why is why is why are people being mean to me i'm i'm the good guy here He's so beneath her that it's not He's even so beneath her. I love the way that she broke up with him. I love yeah, the way when that she, she when she just, leaves him. It's very satisfying. Yeah. She just had a, an awakening of like, what the fuck am I doing? God, am I? and just yeah. walking out of it, you know, because Roy's abuse is very clear, right? You yes. look at that and you're like, this guy is, is a horrible person and he's ruining this person's life. Right. Yes. But the kind of abuse that this guy is doing is so kind of under the radar it's almost like you're like you said he'll never lay a hand on her but he will make her feel like shit every day he will every day she will feel bad every day she'll feel bad she will feel like she's not living up to his standards of what a wife should be that she's bearing the brunt of all the debt she all the constant she's carrying the whole load of the whole thing the whole time and uh she's doing everything and he's disappointed in her yes He's using her goodness and her wanting to please her husband against her. It's a softer evil, but as to me, it's bad. It's just, it's not just as bad, but it's close because he is sucking the joy out of her life. And he may not be physically harming her, but he's destroying her life. And then he's fucking somebody else. You piece of shit, you know, and then, and and, and, and you see that you see that there's a, there's a lady in the closet and I'm like, yeah. I want to fucking put my hands on that guy. <laughs> like, I yes. really want to hurt that guy. <laughs> you know? And also, you, you really care about Indira. She's a wonderful character. Um, yeah. She's trying to do the right thing. She's trying to be a good wife. She's, she also won't compromise herself when the, the billionaire Jennifer Jason Lee makes an offer to her. Um, and she stands her ground. And so you really care about her. So the things that he does to her makes you hate him even worse. Um, Let's talk about Roy getting his comeuppance. How how great was that scene? So uh, all the three threads come together in some crazy ways, including a gigantic shootout between the militia and the state police and the FBI at uh, Roy's compound. Uh, Felt very, um, very Branch Davidian kind of, you know, where like the the federal troops show up and the the militia guys. Well, I mean, the Branch Davidians weren't militia, but, but, you know, that sort of idea or the Ruby Ridge kind of thing the hardcore militant uh, militia guys fighting with the, with the federal police. Um, you know what I, w- what's really interesting is like Roy calls it, puts out the like all hands on deck calls everybody and everybody shows up, has their guns and he's trying to fucking escape while those guys are giving away. their lives for somebody yep. they think is their fucking leader. Who yep. is like trying to get out of the thing. Well, but, and th- but that that's interesting. You bring that up because that is exactly what the old man is calling him out for. You know, the old man saying, you, you, you talk a lot, but, but you're, not, you're not here with the rest of us putting your body on the line. You're not a real believer. Um, but yeah, so, so the, 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 you know, this big battle happens. And while it's going on, Dot, who has again been captured by Roy and, and has escaped, she has an opportunity to get away. She's not trying to get away. She gets a fucking gun and she's going after Roy. She's like... She's like, I'm not leaving this motherfucker alive behind me because he'll come after me again. So I need to put him in the ground. So I'm, while the while the bullets are flying around the compound, you got little Dot over here with a deer rifle hunting her ex husband down. Uh, you got the the nice state trooper that had been with her earlier in that gas station scene. He's there trying to rescue her, um, leading a sort of a, a hostage rescue team to find her and get her out. Um, it, you got you got Roy trying to get out of there alive. Uh, yeah, you got a lot of threads kind of going off at the same time here. And we finally get our moment where Dot gets to confront Roy. And she, and this time, she's got the fucking gun. And she blasts and, uh, him in the fucking stomach. And that shoots awesome. him in the stomach with the deer rifle, which I got to say, probably fairly painful. Yeah, but you know what? We haven't talked about John Hamm's performance in this. 
Which we should, because John Hamm as Roy Tillman is fantastic. I think he's found his niche. He is a good bad. Uh, he was great in Drive. Oh, that's right, Drive. Yeah. So you you watch Drive, and Noah Hawley saw Drive, and that's what gave him the idea for this thing. He was like, "Man, there's oh, a, really there's an yeah there's a presence, there's an energy to him that he would yeah. really work in this." And I I think he was uh, fantastic in this role, and I think this fits good. Not that like he's a bad guy or whatever, but I think he can be charismatic, he can be funny, he can be the handsome guy or whatever. But this one, this performance, I think is one of his best. Well, I yeah I I agree, and I think the I think the thing about John Hamm that works for this kind of part is the same thing that worked so much in, in um, Mad Men. John Hamm, there's something about him that is just incredibly male. He's just he's just the most male male you'll ever see. Yeah, like if if you if you drew a picture of Ultimate Man, you yeah. would draw John Hamm. Yeah. He's tall. He's big. He's 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 got that square jaw. Yeah, he's got that gravelly voice. There's just yeah. something so male energy about him. He's and got it, that big dick energy. Yeah, um, he does have that big dick energy. It, but he's it, got it, all of that. But it's the throwback male to where it's not like gym muscles, right? It's like there's he's a he's a man, and in this role, uh, usually people are like in John's Ham's position, who's you know a gorgeous man who's kind of known for being gorgeous or whatever, he lets go of all vanity in this. He lets go, like he lets the gut hang out. He's he's just a despicable character. He's gross, and he and he fully goes for it and embraces it. And I think like this is the you know I mean everybody loves Don Draper off Mad Men, but I think this is one of the most interesting performances he's played since then. I I I have liked everything he has done since Mad Men. You know, we were talking earlier about actors making smart choices. I think he has made a lot of really smart choices as an actor because you could tack into the obvious version of him and mm-hmm. always play the handsome guy, always play the, the, the romantic lead, whatever. He could totally have done that, and he would have got those parts. But he keeps going, nah, I'd rather do something else. I'd rather do something more interesting than that. And he keeps take, making these interesting choices. And this was an interesting choice for him. And I think he's great in the part. I think he's memorable in the part. <laughs> I think this only opens up more stuff for him. Now, uh, John Hamm at the end, this was a very satisfying scene to me. And it also is my worst nightmare. It's my worst, yeah. like the things that keep me up at night is being. Well, let me, let me set it up for you so you can tell. So you get that confrontation with Dot and, and Roy where she shoots him, but that's not her, his final confrontation with a woman in this show. His final confrontation is he's gone to Wait. prison. He survives. We, we jumped ahead. There's a really important part that I forgot. Okay. So right after Dot shoots. John, if anybody's listening to this, they're like, what? you're fucking all over. What the fuck? I don't even know what yeah, this we're show all over is. Place. Yeah, we're all over the place. But this is how we do it, okay? This is creative. This is like abstract painting. We're doing yeah, our We're doing the Quentin Tarantino painting. version. We jump yeah. back and forth in time, yeah. baby. <laughs> this is Pulp Podcast. Um, yeah, this is a flashback <laughs> inside a flat pe- flashback. This is a, a flashback inside of a flashback. Dot shoots him. Uh, he, snakes, he sneaks off to that underground uh, diamond mine or whatever that is. And, uh, and then he runs into the state trooper that we love, who's a, who's a wonderful person. By the way, this is the only part, this is the only thing in the show that I really didn't like. I, I thought it was, I understood what they were trying to accomplish, but I thought the way it was staged from a directing standpoint didn't make any sense to me. Talk to me. Nobody who is trained to carry and use firearms as part of their job gets that close to somebody that they're holding at gunpoint when there's no backup, I don't carry a gun for a living. And even I know if I have to aim a gun at somebody because they're a threat to my life, the first thing I'm going to do is back up to put 10, 15 feet between us. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And there's nothing that's going to get me closer to that person until I get some fucking backup. And the fact that he got so close to him with the gun is, is very much a TV conceit. You know, the TV conceit of you put the gun right up to the guy Mm because it looks good in the shot or whatever. It Mm -hmm. creates a two shot with the gun. Mm -hmm. I get it. But the consequence of having done that in the show was very disappointing. Uh, I get you. It, that, that was the, I, I don't know if it was because I was so hurt that they killed the guy that I really liked. But I also think that my understanding of it was that the guy didn't really have it in him to kill Roy. When Roy saw that and he was approaching and getting close, and then he tried to call back up because he didn't want to kill somebody. 
And then that's when Roy saw that weakness and came in and got close enough to stab him. It was his hesitation that caused that. I don't want to kill anybody either. But even I, so, I, if, listen, bro, we, we if somebody know, breaks yeah. into my house <laughs> yeah. and I feel like they're a threat yeah. and I'm pointing a gun at them, I'm going to back up to get at least 10 or 15 feet between us and I'm going to wait for the police to arrive. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go get close enough to them that they can stab me. <laughs> yeah, but he, you know, his back was against the brick wall. Either he shoots or he doesn't shoot. A, but it, there, there was a passageway behind him that he could have backed. Yeah, but the thing is, too, though, Ty, not only that, Roy's been killing people this whole fucking show that he yeah. knows about. That and he then, knows and, about. And they're having, they're in the middle of a fucking war up above them. Yep. And the thing, like, guns are fine. It's when he sees Roy, he knows in that moment it's me or him that Roy is going to come. I at feel me. like that should have been the case. Yes. Yeah, and I felt like that they made the decision that he just didn't have the heart to kill somebody. He didn't have, the, have it in him to kill somebody. And so Roy saw that and took advantage of that because as soon as he, cause he was going to shoot him and he goes, he basically challenged him. He's like, I don't think you're going to do it or whatever. And then he goes to call backup. So now Roy knows that he's not going to shoot him. He's, call, he's calling fucking right. backup in the middle of the goddamn Afghanistan war and he's in, right. a, in a bunker <laughs> Well, where they're going to fucking with oh, Hitler. Where are you? What diamond mine or coal mine are you in? That yeah, yeah, exactly. Eat, you know, <laughs> so I felt like he was panicking. I felt like he was panicking, and Roy saw that and then stabbed which him. Which was disappointing it, to me. Which was disappointing. And I think the most moving moment in the show, Dot asks, "Where her state? Where is her state trooper?" And the FBI agent just shakes her head, and uh, and then it, you know, it really gets to her. And I think that was the most moving moment. I get. The story reason they did what they did, I get the thing that they were trying to play there. It just it broke my suspension a little bit because mm -hmm. I was like, no way. I mean, this this cop has already been shot in in an earlier sequence in the show. He's he's been in a firefight. He was in that firefight in the gas station. This is a guy who has been in the battles before, but he um, didn't kill anybody. You know, he, he didn't, didn't. But he, but he. But he also understands the danger of the job and, and to not take someone like Roy seriously, to not create some space so that you are protecting yourself felt like an odd, odd choice for him. Felt like an but, odd, it was the, it's the one false beat for me. But either way, Roy killing him really yeah. made that last scene with him work much better yeah. for me so, so that's the he setup that i was like doing for a you. guy that i really liked so now you go yeah. go ahead so he yeah, the, but just i'm gonna set it up for you so he he winds up in going to prison because he killed a lot of people um so he goes to prison and we get that final confrontation moment where jennifer jason lee's character the billionaire dot's mother-in-law who the billionaire has, in an average house go ahead sorry yes yeah <laughs> and and has decided that she likes dot because Dot's got balls, and, and that character loves with balls, and goes and confronts Roy in prison. And tell him about, tell him about why that's so satisfying. Well, Roy come, walks out. He's got a swatch to go on his neck, and he goes and sits down with her, and he, he looks at her, and is basically, he thinks she's there for, for her to rub in the victory that she's won. Right. And what he says to her is like, I think I'm happy. This is bad as it's going to get. This is the way the world should work, that the races are separated. And he talks about the hierarchy in prison and that the weak get fucked and the strong rise to the top. And he gives this whole speech of like, oh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm OK. I'm going to survive this. This ain't that big of a this deal. This is the and libertarian I'm, ideal I was always hoping for. And, and actually, <laughs> I might be. Actually, I, I might be the king of this fucking place like I was of old Hazard County over there. And yep. uh, so, and she's like, oh, oh, w w you think this was the punishment? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this was not the punishment. Everybody that you think were your friends, they owe me. Everybody in slow cell block D, cell block E, cell block F, they all owe me. And guess what? I'm going to. I have power over them and they have power over you. And then he looks back at his boys who he thinks is going to protect him. And they're looking at him like, you're fucked, dude. We are fucking Yeah, they're looking ass. at him like he's a, like a <laughs> hunk of meat. 
<laughs> yeah. Waiting yeah. to be chewed. Yeah. And, yeah. and then the realization setting in. And then she gives him one pack of cigarettes. Like, you got one little bargaining chip there, buddy. That might save your ass for 30 minutes. But right. <laughs> after that, it's open <laughs> season. And she pushes yeah. it over. And then you see fear in Roy's eyes for the first time. And it feels so good. And she says, I want you to feel the way that Dot felt, the way that all of your wives felt. That's what you're going to feel right now, motherfucker. Well, and and basically it says, I'm putting lots of money in their canteen so that they can buy things like Vaseline and kill bosses. It's like, oh, no, Vienna that's, sausages. Yeah, that's a Vienna bad combination. Sausages. <laughs> Did you want to talk about the Sin Eaters last scene with the Bisquick? Well, we should because we've talked yeah. about Munch. Yeah. Uh, this terrifying should be comical, but instead is terrifying character. This looming figure in the black kilts in the in the combat boots. How great! Was, hold um, on, I, before like as you're setting this up, I do want to say I like that they they gave us a year that they took a year because the, with the scene, I, it, the, when the show is over, the series is over. If the guy in the kilt would have showed up, then she's already in that mode, right? You, we're in yeah. that mode. We're conditioned in that, right? Yep. And then the fact that they start closing the loose ends, right? She has that scene with Gator where she's going to bring him cookies and oatmeal cookies and Gator sells out Roy. And then you see Roy and Roy gets his comeuppance and everybody gets yep. what they deserve and all the debts are paid. And you, you, you relax a little bit. You get at ease and like, oh, this is the epilogue. This is let's round this up. Whatever. Yeah, it's, it's getting to see Dot with her family again. Yeah, That's then you what see we're Dot see. and they, they're, they're fucking, they take more time than you would normally probably would where they go shopping and they bring back and they're, they're putting their little shoes on and she puts her slippers on and then she comes in and fucking much is sitting in the living room and you're like, Oh, that guy. And now I'm re traumatized because I was at ease and yep. this motherfucker. And then you're like, Oh yeah, he still got a debt to pay. And that's his, well, I, I didn't, I didn't, I did not make that assumption. When I saw him, there was part of me that was wondering if he was about to say, I live here now. And Dot goes, yeah, okay, I guess you do. <laughs> All right? Like, I thought that might happen. You know it what? It didn't. That's not what happened. I might have liked that just as much as the way that it did. I might have liked him <laughs> saying, I live here now. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, Dot, you know, we got an extra room. But instead, what happens is we get this moment where he... He tells her that he freed the tiger so that the tiger could finish its fight, which it did. But now the two of them have unfinished business because Dot killed his partner. Uh, Dot hurt him. And in his fucked up version of a code, that's a debt that must be repaid. Yeah. And so he's, he's telling her, I'm here to collect that debt. But it leads to that great moment you mentioned earlier where Dot's basically like, this can go two ways. And, and gives him the speech about forgiveness and gives him the speech about maybe there's another way to handle these things. And maybe sometimes when people have debts, we forgive them those debts because that's in that moment the right thing to do. Or we can go out later and we can get this done with the two of us. And you don't get any sense that she's afraid. Like she's been through hell twice now. If, if some, shit, some shit's got to happen, she's going to be there to make it happen. But she's also saying to him, we can forgive each other. You came after me, and I'm not going to hold that against you. And I hurt you, and maybe you don't have to hold that against me. What did you think about that exchange at the end? I thought her little speech was great. I, I, I liked it. It leads up to a piece that I wonder about, but I'm glad they didn't show it. Because, What's that piece? Well, what she, she talks about the biscuits mm -hmm. and how the biscuits are like, uh, this is wonderful thing that families enjoy together, right? Mm -hmm. And says to him, you know, when he talks about being a sin eater, and, and the fact that he's been alive for all these years carrying the weight of sin. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing he's been able to feel for hundreds of years is the weight of the sin that he took on. And she says, maybe what you need is something that was made with love. And you can, then you can feel the love. And he takes the bite of the biscuit and you just start to smile. That was fine. I like, that was all great. I, I didn't mind any of that. The piece that I wondered is, does he immediately fall over dead? I, I wondered that too. That's what I thought. Yeah. I was like, that would be interesting if he died. But in I'm that, glad in they didn't moment. show that. All right, let's do the top five, baby. Hey, look, I, here's what we should do. We should do the top five of the, <laughs> I know what the top five of the people that I hate most. Okay. It's the old lady's son. 
It's the, uh, the golfer. The golfer. It is the Roy's Roy. father-in-law. Then it's I, your I hate Roy more than the father-in-law, though. Oh, okay. So Roy, Roy's father-in-law, and then it's the your friend, <laughs> your ex-friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I think like, and I think in the diehard space, it is the 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 one that we don't talk about that 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 is a patron on our show. Oh yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah, that guy. The worst. Yeah. Um, and then you wanted to rank the season, the seasons. I have to say, I have I've only watched this this season, so all I can go by is this one being my favorite. Uh, but I think I will. Whatever the ranking is that you guys have is is the one the viewing order that I will go by. I think two five one is my first three, and then Ty, you probably I didn't I don't know the other seasons that well. The oh really? The other two. Okay, yeah. Um, so so season three. Is not the strongest season. It, it makes some. It has some odd storytelling choices, but I, I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. My opinion is that every season of Fargo, the strength of every season of Fargo, is based entirely on the bad guy. I think the scarier and creepier and worse the bad guy is, the better the season is. And I think season two. I'm sorry. I was going to say, who was your favorite bad guy? Well, I th- I think season two. Uh, he's not a bad guy, but I, and I don't mean bad guy. What I mean is antagonist. Yeah. Because sometimes the antagonist isn't really a bad guy. They're just yeah. the antagonist. I thought in season two, the family sort of op- operates as a unit, as a single antagonist. Uh, shoot. What's the character's name? Uh, the, the Indian, the he's, he's awesome in season yeah. two. Yeah. He's awesome. And I think, He's so awesome that it really helps elevate that entire season just off of his awesomeness. I think season five has fantastic bad guys, enigmatic, enigmatic antagonists. You know, you got Roy as an antagonist. Roy is very enigmatic. Munch is incredibly enigmatic. That's what makes, I think for me, season five so powerful. It's incredibly enigmatic bad guys. Season three suffers from not having a great antagonist. But the thing that elevates season three is as, uh, what's her name? Mary Elizabeth Winstead, her mm-hmm. name? Yeah. Um, who I think is one of those beautiful people on the planet. And uh-huh. so just, just go ahead and put her in stuff. I'm fine. I'll sit also, here and watch that. Super yeah. talented. Oh, no, she's fantastic. She's, she's been in a ton of stuff. She's great. But there is not, there's not a great enigmatic antagonist in season four. And that is also my complaint about season four. And so... Season four should be one of my favorite seasons because it's talking about a period of time and a conflict that I find endlessly fascinating, which is that period of time after World War II when more and more uh, black Americans were being integrated into the financial system of America, the capitalistic system of America. You had more black business owners. You had more people, black Black families were buying houses in record numbers for the first time. You had more uh, black men coming back from the war and getting high-paying jobs. They were working in factories for for good wages, like wages good enough that you could buy a nice house and you could buy a car. And and really, for the first time in America, you were seeing this integration of black America into the capitalist monetary system of America. That's all really interesting to me. And season four. I feel like doesn't know what to do with that story. They didn't tell to me the most interesting version of that story. And the season lacked a really compelling antagonist because it's kind of just these gangs all sort of against each other, but no one's, there was no Munch character. There was no, uh, I mean, the season one, Billy Bob Thornton is amazing. He's so great. Right? That character is so amazing. Good. And and season four just doesn't have it doesn't have a munch it doesn't and, have a and, Billy Bob. Thornton. And season one has that thing that I love too is like there's a there's a supernatural element like is he Satan is he evil is he right like, you're like is, is he, he the like, devil <laughs> yeah is he the devil like he he yeah. can he thrives on bad energy like he he turns everything yeah. he's just a chaos maker he's a you know? shit stirrer. A shit stirrer. You're sure some yeah. st- stir but, some but, shit just for the fun a, of it a shit stirrer sounds a too innocent like it sounds like a kid up to mischief like he murders motherfuckers like he ruins oh, yeah. people's lives and kills yeah. people and because he thinks know. it's entertaining yeah to do that yeah. yeah it's 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 a thing that he thrives on 
But because of that, for me, season three and four are not as strong as these other three seasons because they lacked that really iconic antagonist. The kind of the kind of antagonist where every moment they're on screen, you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? What's going to yeah. happen? Because this person is just always doing something crazy, right? And they didn't have that, which is unfortunate. I really wanted to like season four. I like the period that it set in. I like stories that can be told about that period. And I just didn't love the story they chose to. So two, five, one, three, four. Uh, so for me, season one is still my favorite. Okay. So for me, be one, five, two. How do we resolve it? And then three, four. I love you guys. Please like, subscribe, ring that little bell. Say goodbye, Ty. I live here now. <laughs> oh, we switched it up. Oh, you know, Ty last night in bed was like, oh. Oh, I got a fucking good one. I'm going to nail uh, this. That just popped into my head podcast. just now, actually. The whole podcast, he's like, yeah, yeah, you just wait till we end this. I'm going to fucking hit it on a high note. High <laughs> note. Good job, Ty.